On behalf of the Department of French and Italian and the College of Humanities and uh, the Kennedy Center of BYU, I'd like to welcome His Excellency Jean-David Levite to our campus. Ambassador Levite has served as French Ambassador to the United States since December 2002. Prior to this, he worked as the permanent French representative to the United Nations, and prior to that, he was, for five years, the senior diplomatic advisor to French President Jacques Chirac. Ambassador Levy also spent six years on the staff of Valérie Giscard d'Estaing, the French president who is perhaps best known now for his leadership role in writing the Constitution of the European Union. In addition to these positions, Ambassador Levy has worked in Africa, China, and Hong Kong, and has held many other senior positions in the French Foreign Service. He will speak today on a subject he knows perhaps better than anyone, France-U.S. relations. And that's what we love to thank you for coming. Thank you very much. They are... I wouldn't say seats, but ooh, here, <laughs> including my armchair. So please do come in and, and join us and, and, and be seated. I think you will be more comfortable uh, for those who are standing. No, <laughs> okay. I, I'm truly delighted to be with you today. Uh, I consider BYU as not only one of the best universities uh, in the United States and in the world, but certainly the one who prepares the best, the new generation, the future of America that you represent, to the responsibilities which are those of the United States of America in this 21st century. Like it or not, you are the only superpower. Like it or not, you have huge responsibilities in this dangerous world. And it is very important for the United States of America to have a great number of American citizens learning foreign languages, learning foreign cultures and civilizations and <coughs> religions, ready to discover the world, to engage in a true dialogue, a respectful dialogue, with all the people of the world, so that together we can build a better world, a world of understanding, a world of true respect, a world of peace and development. I'm amazed to see so many students to uh, listen to the French ambassador, <laughs> and I guess that there is a lot to explain about what happened. Basically, how come we were together in Afghanistan and not in Iraq? Let me start with a personal experience. I was the French ambassador to the United Nations on 9-11. <coughs> and I saw the destruction of the Twin Towers from my office at the 44th floor of a huge building in downtown New York. And this will remain in my heart for the rest of my days. At that moment, I was the president of the Security Council of the United Nations. And we couldn't reach Paris. No more phone. The mobiles were out. The uh, Verizon system had been destroyed with the towers. And we had to do something. The Security Council had to react. We decided to prepare a draft resolution to be proposed to our colleagues as soon as the doors of the UN building would be reopened. <coughs> and we decided that it was necessary to change international law after what happened. 
and we propose to our colleagues in this draft resolution to decide together that such an act of terrorism should be considered as an act of war, which paves the way, according to international law, to self-defense. And second, we decided to propose to our colleagues that self-defense after such an act of international terrorism should be targeted not only towards those who committed these acts, that is, the terrorist network, but also the states which offered hospitality, training, equipment, financing to the terrorist network. This resolution was proposed to my colleagues in the Security Council on the 12th of September, the day after, at 10.13 in the morning. The moment <coughs> the doors of the UN building were reopened. And it was adopted unanimously in one hour. It shows that from time to time, the Security Council can act unanimously and fast. <laughs> and nobody had instructions because we couldn't reach our capitals. But we knew what we had to do. And I propose to my colleagues to adopt this resolution not by raising our hands as we always do, but by standing to offer our solidarity, respect and admiration to the American people and to the New Yorkers. The leading French daily that day had a big title we are all Americans. And that was exactly the mood at the time. And President Chirac was the first to come to the United States to offer our solidarity, our cooperation. He met President Bush on the 18th of September in Washington and then on the 19th was in New York to show the New Yorkers our admiration, respect and solidarity. And France did participate in the war in Afghanistan with 5,000 troops, the aircraft carrier Charles de Gaulle, and together with your, uh, with your planes, we were the only country participating in the bombing of the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. We still maintain troops in Kabul. We have hundreds of them. It is now a NATO operation. And starting next summer, the common structure of this NATO operation will be the Eurocorp with a French general in charge. And we still maintain special forces fighting with yours on the border with Pakistan to try to uh, take control of the last elements of the Taliban and the leaders of Al-Qaeda. So how come we were together in Afghanistan and not in Iraq? It started with, it started with the speech delivered by President Bush in the General Assembly of the United Nations on the 12th of September 2002. President Bush proposed to the world to join forces to disarm Iraq, if possible through the UN inspections peacefully, if not by the use of force. Everybody applauded. And we started immediately a negotiation which lasted eight weeks, but which was concluded by great success. Resolution 1441 was adopted unanimously. I was the French negotiator, and we all considered that this resolution paved the way to a success story, that is, the immediate deployment of the UN inspectors, and through the UN inspections, 
the peaceful disarmament of Europe. So what went wrong? So far, so good. In parallel with the inspections, American troops were deployed around Europe. It was a good idea because it showed to Saddam Hussein that this time he had to behave, to cooperate fully, because otherwise the use of force would be certain. And this message was understood loud and clear by Saddam Hussein. He cooperated more and more. The problem emerged when the deployment went beyond, let's say, 50,000 troops, which was enough to send this powerful message to Saddam Hussein. The moment America had deployed 300,000 troops, then the pressure to use them became quite irresistible in Washington. At the time, I was in Washington, I had been transferred from New York to, to Washington. And I could feel the pressure. A number of people said it was a question of credibility for President Bush vis-à-vis -vis the American people, and of credibility for the US vis-à-vis -vis the whole world. If the troops are deployed and you don't use them, the credibility of the U.S. was in danger. <coughs> but the mood was quite different in the Security Council, where a majority of the countries, 50, uh, 11 out of 15, considered that the U.N. inspections were working, producing results. You have seen on your screens the destruction at the request of Hans Blix, the chief of the UN inspectors, by the Iraqi army itself, of a whole branch of mission, missiles, missiles Al Samut II. This is really disarmament. So why stop? We were not in an impasse. The mood in the council for the majority of the members was. Let's continue. This war is not necessary at that time. That was the view of France. And we considered that it was very important to continue the inspections to show that the tool of the United Nations, the inspectors, was working. <coughs> 